Throughout the ages, history has been altered by word of mouth and the misrepresentation of those who might not have been present when some of the world's most significant events took place. Channelers Barry and Connie Strom bring through the spirits of those who actually witnessed or took part in these historical events and lets them tell their stories in their own words. Welcome to Channeling History, and now, here are your hosts, Barry and Connie Strong. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Channeling History. We're the only show where we speak to the souls that made things happen. All of our guests are on the other side of the life veil, and we're brought to you on the Parax Radio Network. I'm Barry Strom, your host, and I'll be doing the channeling tonight. And I'm Connie Strom, your co-host. Last week, we discussed a lot of information about aliens. Laura gave us a lot of significant background information about extraterrestrials. And last week's show is available on Potomatic or our YouTube channel. Tonight, we're going to continue our investigation of aliens. We will take questions for our chat room that apply to tonight's subject matter. We will not be taking a break tonight, so we can spend much more, as much time as possible channeling our guest spirits. Now, all of our shows are available on our YouTube channel, as Connie mentioned. It's in my name, Barry Strom. If you want to download them, it's easier to go to Potomatic.com and just search Channeling History. We hope that you tell your friends about us. We would certainly like to grow our listenership. If you'd like to learn more about ancient aliens, I'd also like to remind you that I wrote a book called Aliens Among Us, Exploring Past and Present. It's available on Amazon or on my website, barrystrom.com. We always give a small disclaimer, so the opinions or statements voiced on our show are the channel words of the spirits. Do not necessarily reflect our opinions, those of the Parax Network or of our sponsors. And in addition, before we channel, we always say a prayer of protection. Connie's going to say the prayer, and uh, we're going to get on with finding some more information about the alien presence. God, please grant us your wisdom and protection. <clears throat> grant us the knowledge that we can handle and keep us safe from all things that will harm us. Keep the messages positive and pure love. Keep us safe from our egos. We ask these things in the light of the seen, the unseen, and the honesty of God. Amen. Okay, last week <clears throat> we channeled an alien spirit from the planet Robe. It's a planet on the far side of the Milky Way galaxy. It was the same planet that our friend Moo, who we channeled for the book, came from. He's been kind enough to join us again tonight. And since we cannot pronounce his true name, he called us just to call him Fred. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, we've invited him back, and we're going to start off by asking him some questions. Fred, thank you so much for coming back. Uh, will you tell us a little bit more about your home planet, Robe? Well, it's on about as far away from here as you can get. It's on the far wing, far spiral of the Milky Way. It's a large planet. It's about the size of your Jupiter. Many things are different on the planet. Uh, we have a different water where your water is H2O, ours is H3O. It's a heavy water. It's a very harsh planet to live on. Most of the time we spend underground. The natural assets of, of the planet are quite slim. We don't waste anything. The ratio of men to ladies on the planet is about five to one. So there's one male for five females. As I say, we don't waste much of anything there. <laughs> uh, would you describe your appearance for us? <laughs> Somehow I don't think you look a bit like me. <laughs> no, not unless you're turning blue, Connie. <laughs> I, when, I was, when I was alive, I stood roughly seven, seven and a half of your feet. <clears throat> my skin is blue. I have fairly large ears, large eyes, very small mouth. It's it's 
it's a very, very different appearance. But you'll find that on all the other planets, there are many, many different kinds of extraterrestrials. And their appearances all vary. Yes, we were told last week about a seven-foot spider. Uh, will you describe your appearance? Oh, I'm sorry. When you were alive, did you ever visit Earth? And if you did, what was the purpose of that visit? I visited Earth one time. I was part of a large expedition. We wanted to come and we wanted to observe how you humans were doing. Aliens do that. We have been told that we're supposed to try to watch out for humans and protect them where we can. We're aware that humans are doing many things that uh, are not conducive to life on your planet. So I traveled one time. We did do several abductions of humans. We did not hurt them. We studied them. None of them really realized that we had had brought them upon our ship. And we learned a lot from them. When you were alive, how long did it take for you to travel from your planet to the Earth? Well, it depends. It's a very, very long way, so it could take us as much as 10 days, which for us is a very long journey. How is it possible to travel such long distances in such a short period of time? First of all, we have means of travel that you've never seen nor can comprehend. When we transport our ships for large distances, quite often we take advantages of wormholes that are in the in space. You've never discovered any of them yet, but when you get in these wormholes, you can ex- you can accelerate to speeds far beyond any of your beliefs. We can also, when we're on the other side, we can simply change dimensions, and because of the difference in dimensional Distances, it's just very, very simple when you're on the other side in spirit form. Could you give us a little more description of the wormholes and ex- explain exactly what they are? That will be very difficult for you to understand as well. It is, think of it as anti gravity on an exponential scale. When you come into these naturally occurring wormholes, the effect is of incredible acceleration and speeds. There are are different locations where you can leave the wormholes, but it is a very, very economical way to travel through vast distances. What is your average lifespan on that planet? On our life, on that planet, we live around 750 of your years. Time is different on our planet, and we have learned many of the lessons of God. So it is not as important that we come back and reincarnate as it is for souls that live on earth and need to come back to learn many lessons. On Robe, how do you communicate with each other? We can communicate in multiple ways. We can do it verbally, but it's not necessarily. We've learned to communicate basically through mental telepathy. I can think what I want the, my friend to hear me thinking and He will answer. There are people here on Earth that actually have some very elemental abilities to communicate mentally. Right now I'm communicating with Barry mentally. So you see that it really is possible. How do you spend your days on robe? I don't guess you're out on a golf course or anything like that. No. We are not on, we do not have golf courses there. But we do have types of work. We have 
our ships that travel. We have vehicles that we use to get around on the planet. We do most of what we do on underground, as I said. We have homes that we build. So there are things that we do. Yes, we could have robots do most of the work, but we find that it is far better that individuals are kept busy. When individuals are idle on our planet, they can tend to drift away from the path that is best for all. It sounds like the same thing could happen here. Uh, will you describe some of your advanced technologies, if we can understand them? You can understand the results of our advanced technologies. Our greatest technologies are in high-speed transportation. We have ships that can move at speeds far behind your comprehension. You look at the speed of light as a limiting factor. You will find that we've discovered how to use the speed of light as an accelerator for our vehicles. We also have the ability to make our vehicles totally transparent. We can allow our ships to be in many places unobserved. We also have the ability to transport individuals. It's a little bit like the old, shall we say, your primitive beam me up, Scotty, from the movies. <laughs> but when we do abductions, if we want the individual on the ship, we can convert them into an antimatter that we can take a human body and transport it immediately onto our vehicles. Hmm. Is there a base ship that supports visits to the planets in our solar system? There is basically one huge ship that supports most of the excursions. We generally keep it pretty well hidden behind one of your planets, so it has not been observed. The ship is quite large. Basically, it is almost the same size as the United States. It is huge. It has many different types of space vehicles on it. There are many extraterrestrials from different planets. As we've spoken many times, the advanced civilizations get along very well. So you would find on an average smaller ship that would come to visit the planet Earth. There may be three or four different types of extraterrestrials on that ship. We try to cooperate. That is the key to all of the successes that the advanced civilizations have had. How many different alien types of are there in this solar system? <clears throat> I would say, as an estimate, there are over 250 different alien types. You see, there are many planets that support life. And each planet has a different life form. I know that on the base ship, we have over 200 types. There are young cultures where there are young cultures that are not represented because their technologies are not advanced to the point that they can contribute. So I would say as an estimate there would be over 250 intelligent life forms in the galaxy. Okay, we've got some questions coming from our listeners. Uh, first question, is there a reason why there are so many more women than men on your planet? Yes, as I said, our resources are quite scarce. So we don't want to, to 
utilize more resources than we have to. So we found that an ideal family size would be one male to five females. So it is just an, a natural way of things that we would not plan the birth of more of the males forms than were necessary to advance our culture. Another listener would like to know if there's a way that a human could come and tour your <clears throat> ship. No. <laughs> At this point, there are regulations against it. Keep in mind that the fact that we merely exist is a secret that is maintained by your government. There will be a time that we will allow humans. There have been times in the past where some of your very high-ranking individuals, such as presidents, have been given tours of our ships. But that is a very rare occurrence. Okay, you mentioned that you can keep your ships invisible to humans. How is that possible? We can basically put the ships into a dimension that cannot be seen by humans. Oh. For instance, ghosts or earthbound spirits are in a dimension that cannot be seen by humans. So there are multiple dimensions. We have the ability to, switch, to throw a switch and place a ship into another dimension. That is the same principle as what you refer to as a Bigfoot. They will move back and forth between seen and unseen dimensions. And we have the ability to do that with our our vehicles. Okay. Is there some type of government or agency that controls the different civilizations in the galaxy? Yes. You will find as you advance that the galaxy has shall we say, a very organized management system. There are representatives from all the planets, all the civilizations that communicate and set policy. They determine how the younger planets or civilizations are to be protected. They design excursions, they determine what the younger cultures should be taught. They work together to build the different ships that we use. They are in charge of determining who gets to go on these different excursions, the need for them. There are many areas of the galaxy that are still more primitive than others, and they have to be protected. But there is a very strong governing system. Okay, Another one of our listeners would like to know, uh, are you allowed to help a healed or heal an injured human? That will depend. Once again, you have to, you humans come back with life plans. Before we would attempt to heal a human, we would check with their guides. Our abilities far exceed those of what, anything you're aware of. So some of us can contact those that are in spirit form, and we would not do anything to heal a person if that injury or sickness was part of a lesson that that individual has to learn. Yeah. Okay, getting back to this organization that rules the, you know, the galaxy, how are the different civilizations represented? Each of the major civilizations have two officials that will attend the different conferences or meetings where policy is determined. The lesser cultures, if they are starting to advance, 
will be allowed to have one representative that can attend or will be shown a way technically that they can have an appearance at the committee meetings. The very young civilizations do not have any representatives. Yeah. Then all civilizations are not represented. There are some that are out of it. Is Earth represented? Yes. Earth has been allowed to have a single representative. And that has taken place for several hundred years. Hmm. Are our presidents aware of this governing body? Yes. Your presidents are aware. And in fact, several of your presidents have been taken on voyages on our ships. So they are well aware of what takes place around them. Are there rules that govern travel and what takes place in the galaxy? Yes. There are definite rules. For instance, Earth is very well protected. There are guidelines as to what visitors can do, and there are guidelines as to what visitors cannot do. Through the years, the guidelines have changed. In the past, we have been allowed fairly radical testing to take place during abductions because we wanted to totally understand and assure that humans were not destroying themselves. As you have come closer to disclosure, many of the rules have become much more conservative. But what takes place when extraterrestrials visit Earth is very well coordinated with what is best for humans. Uh, we have another question from the chat room. Uh, are we allowed to ask what president was on a, one of the ships? Your President Truman rode, went for a ride on one of our ships. Okay, thank you. Uh, are the rules different when you're visiting a young civilization? Yes. When you're visiting young civilizations, you have to be careful not to set any precedences that will have harmful effects into the future. We can do many things. For instance, if a young civilization does not have elaborate communication techniques, we can do more things. We can isolate our help. We can try to work with them. You can see that in many of your petroglyphs that the ancients drew on the walls of caves and on cliff faces. You will see that we were much more outgoing in those days, that we would help them, and that we did not feel that it was as necessary to keep our presence a secret. We were not afraid to use different alien types that you can see evidence of in the Nazca lines that we discussed last week. But there are many different rules for different civilizations. What happens if someone breaks the rules? Are there penalties? Yes. If a visitor to Earth were to break the rules, they would immediately be ordered to return to their home planet. And there would be restrictions placed on members from that planet being able to participate in future excursions. There are also financial penalties, depending what they would do. And I use the word financial because our our types of 
shall we say, monies that we use in trade are much different than what you use for trade on earth. But there are multiple types of penalties that can be applied. The worst is if we, the worst is that we stop them from participating in future excursions. Okay, Fred, thank you. Let's get a little bit more specific. Let's jump over to crop circles. Crop circles are shapes that are imprinted in generally in grain fields. Quite often, they're quite intricate images. And believe it or not, they've been around for a long time. The first recorded crop circle appeared in England in 1678. The document that showed sketches of this referred to them as a mowing devil because obviously the people at that time had no clue what was taking place. So they've been with us for a very long time. So, Connie, let's ask Fred a couple questions about crop circles. Yeah. Fred, when you were here, did you participate in making any crop circles? Yes, we did. We thought that it was fairly entertaining to do. We realized that the humans had no ideas of what was taking place. And when a human would look looks at a crop circle, it really messes with their minds. <laughs> yes, you're very successful in that. So that crop circles were invented by you, by the aliens. Yes, generally they're done with the smaller ships, but crop circles were invented by aliens. Now there are a lot of humans that have fake crop circles trying to get publicity or fame or whatever they try to get. But the real intricate crop circles are definitely the work of extraterrestrials. What is the purpose of a crop circle? Well, one other of the than main, messing with humans, <laughs> that's one of the main ones. That's true. We really enjoy what, sitting back and watching what humans think when they see when they wake up in the morning and they see this huge circle, or de- these, all of these intricate forms in their in their crops. We can do leave messages sometimes. We like to leave messages for other vehicles that are part of our excursion. And sometimes you might think of them as alien graffiti. (laughs) Okay. Is there always some kind of meaning to the crop circles? There is always some type of meaning. Sometimes we use them like you would use a crossword puzzle where... Our friends on the other vehicles are, we challenge them to see what what the meaning was that we wrote on the circle. But generally, it is just something to let humans understand that they don't under, that they don't know everything that takes place around them. How do you physically make a crop circle? It is done by directing blasts of air. If you look real close at a crop circle, you can see that the grain is is laid over. So we have means of down bursts of air, and it can be very intricate. Sometimes we consider them works of art, but it is, as far as I know, or have ever been associated with any of them. Crop circles are done by downbursts of air. Fascinating. Um, Let's talk a little bit about alien abductions. Are they real? Absolutely. Alien abductions have been going on for, well, since the creation of life on the planet. In the beginning... We would abduct early human forms. We would try to lead them. Keep in mind in the beginning that humans were very, very primitive. They didn't even have fire. They did not have 
mean any means of getting around. They would basically hunt and eat like animals. So we would try to guide them. We would abduct them. We would bring them up onto the ship. Many of them, as in today's, did not know that they were being abducted. And we would try to implant information into their brains. We would try to give them instructions in their subconscious. We would try to do many things that would help them. But they are very, very real. What are the purposes of the alien abductions? Is it just strictly to help us advance? Through the years, the purpose of abductions has changed. As I say in the beginning, it was trying just simply to teach them basics. It was an attempt so that they would advance above the level of of the animals with which they were living. Throughout time, we would try to do different things with them. We tried to implant the ideas of a supreme deity. That came later after they had advanced. We tried to show them the effects of fire, that they could cook their meals, and it really, until they advanced in the preparation of meals and sanitation, in their cooking methods, there was little that we could do to help them. Fire was a very difficult concept because a fire has to be kept burning. The techniques for keeping fire burning took many hundreds and thousands of years for them to learn. They needed to learn to hunt. Humans especially needed to learn to live in communities. Now, sadly, once they started to live in communities, they learned to war with other communities. We would continuously try to guide. The easiest way was through an abduction. It was, it would take more manpower and concentrated effort for us to go in person and to show them many of the techniques that they needed. In the end, we were forced to do that. And that is the only way that humans were truly able to advance. One of our listeners would like to know, does our government stage alien invasions so that we'll think negatively of the aliens? That has not taken place that I am aware of. I do not see any advantage for humans thinking negatively of extraterrestrials. The whole purpose is for extraterrestrials to be able to train and to help humans. There may be isolated instances. For instance, I know that we have shown humans cures for diseases that have not come into fruition because pharmaceutical companies could make more money from not allowing the information to come forth. But I do not believe that your government will stage invasions to build negativity. Uh, Are there any rules concerning abductions, and how have the rules changed over time? The rules have changed quite drastically. In the beginning, we did not have to be as careful. Today, the committee and your government has decided to maintain secrecy about the presence of aliens. When we abduct individuals today, we are very careful to make sure that they do not have any memory of the abduction. There are instances 
where we make mistakes and perhaps the individual will have some recollection, but that is quite rare. Today, we do not do anything that is going to injure a human. We will study them. We will try to program them. We will try to do many things. But everything that we do in an abduction today is meant to be positive towards the abductee. Fred, how is it possible that an abduction takes place without the person recognizing or remembering it? We change dimensions. If if an individual ventures into another dimension, in all probability they will not remember it. Quite often your mind will venture into other dimensions in your dreams. And you may possibly think of it as a dream, or you may have no recollection of it. We have the ability to totally place you into another dimension in which we are very sure that you're not going to have any recollection. I totally believe that for a good reason. Uh, Are humans ever injured or killed during an abduction these days? It was fairly common that humans would be injured in the earlier days. Today we're more careful. Today we have a better understanding of how we can handle these abductions without injuring the individual. Today we are very, very careful. We are getting closer now to disclosure. So it is very important that we do not do anything that is going to alienate the humans as we approach this time of disclosure. We want disclosure to go very well. We want humans not to live in fear of extraterrestrials. Uh, One of our listeners would like to know, aren't abductions violating our free will? Yes, they are. But it is with a positive intent. If we had not been doing abductions, you would still be carrying bags of fire around with you. Mm. So in one in in one way of thinking about it is that it goes against your free will, but you have to keep in mind all the positive aspects. Okay, another listener would like to know, are humans being abducted in national parks? It is possible that an abduction will take place in a national park, but there is no reason why we have to do it there. We can do abductions anywhere. We have means of doing this. Generally, when people disappear in national parks, it is the result of a kidnapping. Okay, Connie, you were abducted. I'm not sure any of the listeners know or have heard the story. But getting back to the fact that you do not have to do this in a national park, <laughs> you were abducted while driving a car on I-95 in Florida. So Yes, through West Palm Beach. <laughs> yeah, why don't you tell our <laughs> listeners a little bit about what happened to you? Yeah, I had just dropped Barry off at the airport. And I was driving back uh, on Interstate 95, which was quite busy. It was 10 o'clock in the morning on a work day. And I took note to an exit that I was passing. And then it was like someone pressed a button and totally took away my consciousness. And then later, someone pressed a button again. And I was totally conscious. And I looked and I was two exits further north. So we thought, oh, it must have been something to do with my heart. So I went to my cardiologist, and he said, no, Connie, you must have fallen asleep. But I thought that didn't make sense to me, because if I'd fallen asleep, my body would have relaxed, and I'd have wrecked the car and probably taken some people out with me. But I just 
stopped thinking about it after a while. And then several years down the road, we were communicating with Moo, our blue guy that helped us write two books. And I, Barry asked him, he said, Moo, have Connie or I ever been abducted? And he said, Connie has. And I knew exactly when it was. And I said, Moo, how come my car didn't wreck? And he said, it's easy when you know how. And I said, okay, how? And his answer was, shapeshifter. So evidently, they took me from the car and they put a shapeshifter in to drive it up those two exits. And I absolutely have no memory of it. It's just like a button was pushed, like I said, to turn my consciousness off. And a button was pushed later on to put it back on again. So that, that was my experience. It was quite amazing. Yes, and they decided not to keep her, too. So <laughs> I hope they learned something valuable, but I don't know what. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. i, I got to stop. Yes, okay. you do, dear. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's change subjects here before I really get in the doghouse. There's stone construction in Great Britain that you refer to as Stonehenge. Stone forms have symmetry and shapes that relate to astronomy and geometry. Now, the amazing part of this is that the work began on the structures around 3000 BC. So, Connie, let's uh, ask Fred some questions about Stonehenge. Okay, Fred, did the aliens assist in the construction of Stonehenge? Absolutely. There's no way the people could have ever done it. How did the ancients lift such heavy stones? They're gigantic. We had cranes. Oh. We, we we wanted to help them. We realized that they were never going to be able to do it on their own. And we wanted to util, utilize these stones to give the humans a means to study astronomy, to study the seasons, to understand why some days were short, some days were long. So we decided that the best way would be to establish a structure where they could learn on their own. Now, keep in mind, by 3000 BC, humans were base, basically had the same capabilities of intelligence that humans have today. So we assisted them in building the early structures. Once that was done, then changes took place through, the, through time. Uh, different structures were added through the years. But in the beginning, we were definitely responsible for it. Do aliens still visit that site? They travel over and look at it and say, hey, look at uh, what we used to do in the past. But they don't use the site any longer. Okay, I believe you told us what the purpose was. Um, the huge stones came from a location almost 200 miles away from the Stonehenge site. How did the ancients ever transport them that distance? Well, they didn't. It was quite simple. We transported them in our UFOs. It was very, very difficult to teach them the technologies that they needed. And we felt that that stone from those distant quarries or different locations at the time would help them it had the stones had different characteristics. We also had to show them how to quarry the stones and to cut them. We had laser tools that we could use to help, but there was a time that they had to take over and, and do it themselves. But you will find that many of the smaller stones that were used were eventually taken away from Stonehenge. The farmers the people that lived in the areas would use some of the smaller stones to build their homes. The weather is quite nasty up in that part of what is now Great Britain. And stone construction became a, a very popular way to help individuals stay warm in the winter. But Stonehenge served a great purpose. It taught primitive man how to begin 
to understand the most elemental things that were taking place around them, the different lengths of the day, the times that days would begin to shorten. It allowed them to help plan. If you knew that in such a configuration of the planets or of the stars that it would be safe to plant your crops. So there were many, many things that Stonehenge brought to the early individuals of the area. Hey, we have a listener that would like to know, what are you teaching us in the present day? Today we're teaching you what information that you will need to advance into the future. Sometimes we have to teach you how to get along with others. Sometimes we have to teach you advanced techniques. We are bringing back people presently that are capable of learning great technologies. Sometimes there are mental barriers that we have to help them overcome. But essentially what we're doing in the current time is preparing humans for full disclosure and understanding what takes place around them. Okay, another question from the chat room. You said that you will sometimes program us humans. What kind of programming do you do, and why do you do it? It might be that an individual has been sent back to accomplish great things, and that that individual is pulling away from his life plan. We will try to give them direction. There are times that humans have a mental, shall we say, hurdle in learning the technology. There may be some minor thing that is keeping them from developing some great invention. We can take them and try to give them a learning program that will get them over to that hurdle. Some of the greatest minds were abducted on numerous times. At the beginning of the Renaissance, we tried to help individuals advance in their learning. We would give them ideas. For instance, Da Vinci. We would give him information and try to lead him down the path of learning. So there can be many reasons. Okay, another comment and question. Um, I saw a UFO that split into four. They did a light dance and then shot into space. What was the point for the light dance? Probably just to get your attention. (laughs) Sometimes we do many things just to see how humans react to it. (laughs) Okay, another question. Uh, Where on earth was Atlantis located? Uh, The closest landform to that would be Bermuda. Okay. Um, Let's see here. Are there any aliens that represent a threat to humans? It is possible that an alien can go against the regulations. If they do that, they could be threats to humans. Sometimes they get carried away with their own feelings of superiority, just like humans do. The greys come from a warlike background, and there are times that they perhaps have have troubles adapting to the current regulations and rules. But when extraterrestrials visit Earth, they are very well monitored. 
That's good. They wear a device that can record their future thoughts. That is how advanced we are. And if that device indicates that there is a risk, that extraterrestrial will be pulled back immediately. We know how delicate humans are, and we understand many of the inabilities that they have. So the committee does its best to assure that humans are going to make it into the future. Yeah, as I mentioned, a shapeshifter took over driving my car for me. Um, could you tell us about them? We have many technologies, as I said. It is possible that we can take a form and change that form to emulate a human. There are actually many individuals that are living lives of humans that have had their forms changed. Many of those people have great intellect, and many of those people are doing all they can to help humans advance. It is using shapeshifters is a way to transition towards total disclosure. It is a way to... It, their goal is generally to prepare for the future. What type of extraterrestrials are the most prevalent on Earth? There are different varieties that have the ability to shapeshift. The Palladians have forms very, very similar to humans and only require small, shall we say, adjustments to fit in. They have been around for so many generations that there are actually Palladians that do not realize that they have extraterrestrial backgrounds. So I would say that the greatest life form on Earth right now of extraterrestrials are Palladians. Fred, is there going to be a time that it will be normal to have extraterrestrials living among humans and we won't even think anything of it? Absolutely. If you don't, you will cease to exist. The only way that humans will be able to learn the advanced technologies that is required for their future evolution is through cooperating with the extraterrestrials. You've been visited by them for hundreds of thousands of years. There were times that you accepted them. There were times that you thought extraterrestrials were gods. We only mean to help you. If we wanted to wipe humans from the face of the earth, you would be long gone. We have such technologies that it would be extremely easy to eliminate humans. That is why the excursions are so closely monitored. Fred, we really enjoyed having you here again this evening. Do you have a final message for us? Yes. First of all, thank you. Thank you for writing the books about us in the past. And thank you for allowing us to try to speak the truth about extraterrestrials. We truly do not mean humans harm. We know that there's going to be a time that life will cease to exist on this planet. And we must prepare humans to travel the stars so that they can establish communities on other planets if they're going to exist. That is our goal. That is our goal. It is to lead humans into technologies. To do that, they must learn to coexist. Today, you're at a phase where you're using your technologies to make war and to kill others. Humans have got to get over that phase, or they will simply cease to exist. In the very near future, you're going to find out just how much activity 
from extraterrestrials takes place around you. So thank you for allowing me to speak. I always appreciate the opportunity. Someday I may even tell you my true name. <laughs> so thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Fred. Okay. That was two very interesting shows put together. Next week we're going to do something a bit different. We're going to channel with Helen Keller and her teach and her teacher Ann Sullivan. At the age of 19 months, Helen Keller contracted a disease that left her deaf and blind. In spite of her disability, she became a well-known author, political activist, lecturer, and advocate for disability rights. She is, and she was, and her soul still is, an incredible example for people with disabilities. So we're going to devote our show next week to an individual that overcame the greatest disability possible. My 10th book, Modern Messages of the Archangels, will now be available on October 1st. It can be purchased in soft cover and ebook on Amazon. Signed copies are available on my website, barrystrom.com. During the past several years, Connie and I channeled 20 different archangels, and we're going to bring you those messages in a single volume. We could not be more excited about this new relief release. It will truly change lives. The messages are incredible and taking a lot. And if read along with the messages of God, it's a wonderful combination. So, all of our shows are available on our YouTube channel. They're my name, Barry Strom. If you want to download them, go to podomatic.com and search Channeling History. I'd like to thank you all for listening to our show this evening. We've been bringing you Channeling History now for almost three years. Un unbelievable. So all of our shows, of course, are available on YouTube, the YouTube channel in Barry's name. Or if you want to download them, you can go to podomatic.com and search Channeling History. So have a wonderful week, everybody. I hope that you tell your friends about our shows. I go back and I actually listen to some of them because I'm a history nut. We have done so much in the past three years. If you really have an interest in history, we give you all the opportunity in the world to learn history from those who actually lived it. So thank you for listening. Please join us Sundays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on the Parax Radio Network. Thanks for listening to Channeling History. Tune in again next week for another electrifying episode as we never know who will make an appearance or who will come through the portal. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2020. Our story begins by Kevin McLeod, licensed through Incompetech.com. Thank you.